Great. So let's let's talk for a little bit about uh, trade-offs. Um, this. Uh, so I I've mentioned before I um, been somewhat uncomfortable position of straddling multiple communities in system science and actually outside of system science, and um, there is no love lost between some of these communities traditionally. Um, uh, often it's very different sociological and uh, and uh, technical communities that pursue agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, discrete event modeling, and uh, not infrequently practitioners of one only have dim ideas about what the other is doing or sometimes not even aware of the other's existence. In so, some cases I found micro simulation modelers totally unaware of the existence of discrete event modeling as a practice, which is remarkable because it's the dominant practice, um, simulation modeling wise, in health over, over many decades um, in terms of number of models contributed. Um, but these days, the techniques are drawing closer. And that, that um, proximity is, in some cases, leading to a, a grudging acceptance or even a enthusiasm about how to merge these techniques and at least trying to think about how do we make sense of these different techniques. And um, you know, here are four of them that we've used quite extensively in our work. System dynamics, agent-based modeling, discrete event modeling, and more classic uh, social network analysis. These are often called system science techniques. Um, and uh, I'm not one for getting caught up in, in labels, lumping and splitting. So I'm not going to I'm not going to comment on whether you know I think uh, Markov modeling should be part of system science or not, or or um, where machine learning fits in. Um, so system dynamics and um, and agent-based modeling are each rich traditions, and I don't have time to go into these. Often I present them. I want to cut to get down to the basics of what I think some useful distinctions are, because many of you I know have some exposure to both traditions. You've seen them during the course of this week. Um, those who have who have had the opportunity to be here will have used some uh, for both, and I think. One of the problems that comes in when people compare these techniques, say system dynamics versus agent-based modeling, besides the fact that we can combine them fruitfully, as you've seen many times, is the fact that often people assume tacitly that a system dynamics model, a compartmental model, an ODE model, however you want to call it, a state equation model, is an aggregate model and agent-based models by definition are articulated at an in individual level. So there's often a conflation, a kind of confusion of, of, of what the potentials of each approach are by, by virtue of the fact that people are implicitly assuming system dynamics has to be applied at an aggregate level. And you have seen in the course of this week now multiple models where system dynamics has been applied within an individual. Um, and uh, here, um, you know, we, we need to separate those two, those two distinctions out. So comparing aggregate models and individual models is a fruitful thing. Um, we do often have a choice. Do we want to build an aggregate model or do we want to build an individual-based model? Um, and there are some very big trade-offs between these. I, We've built a lot of these, and I've built a lot of these, um, dozens of each. And uh, and I've tried to list here some of the what I consider the salient practical trade-offs. Aggregate models, I can often put together an aggregate model very quickly. Um, uh, I can calibrate it a bit more easily. There are fewer moving parts. There's no stochastics. Um, I can some because there's fewer parameters. I can often parameterize it a bit more easily and. Sometimes I can understand the dynamics because it's based on a few stocks and flows. I can understand it better. One of the most critical reasons that people rely on these models is for formal analysis. If, and this is a big if, if you are interested in understanding the theoretic behavior of this model under different parameter assumptions, say for different pathogens that could be depicted within this model, you know, Norwalk virus and, um, and uh, you know, uh, flu, all within the same model, depicted in a more abstract way. Um, or if you want to understand the um, 
the long-term behavior of the model. It's, it's so-called equilibria, um, uh, disease-free and endemic. You want to understand the structure of those. You want to understand the stability. How does the, how does the stability of this, of this equilibrium, its ability to, to push back against it if there's you know, a disturbance, like someone flies in with the pathogen into the airport, uh, to what degree is it a stable situation? Or to what degree will an outbreak occur? Formal analysis is very valuable. If you want to understand how the equilibria depend on the assumptions about the pathogen, it's, it's um, recovery, the mean time to recovery, or the latent period. Formal analysis is extremely powerful. And we just don't have the mathematics to do that with uh, individual-based models at nearly the level we can with an aggregate model, particularly individual-based model with stochastics. It's, we have a little bit there, but it's, it's, it's small potatoes compared to what we could do with an aggregate model. Um, as of yet, maybe 50 years from now, we'll have a better basis, but right now, not so much for formal analysis. Um, Performance-wise, models that are aggregate are much quicker to run. Um, so if you have a particle filter running with, a, with a, um, an aggregate model within it, you can run it quite quickly, even with 10,000 particles. Um, uh, it, can, it can run out um, in less than an hour. Um, and, and what this means is you can often experiment with these models um, on a quicker turnaround basis. Um, and part of that reflects the fact we're not running Monte Carlo ensembles for our just day-to-day -day running of them. Um, and um, you know, often we have a more accessible set of skills which are required for aggregate models um, compared to the programming required for individual-based models. Um, and the fact that we can build these quicker, we can run them quicker, means there's often more time for understanding and refinement of the model. Um, we have, we have quicker cycle times, we can evolve it, we can refine aspects of it. By contrast, individual-based modeling has profound benefits um, of its own. Um, if you want to represent situated decision-making, you want to support highly targeted policies, targeted based on longitudinal features of people's backgrounds, on their networks, or their spatial location. Um, you're going to be able to do that with an individual-based model much more effectively. This ability to calibrate to and validate off of longitudinal data is a really big issue here. And it's probably something we may see in an example today, if I have my druthers. Um, we haven't done it yet, but we'll probably do so. I, I was close to doing it yesterday, but uh, decided not to. But it's very easy in an individual-based model to keep track of a person's history. So for a given person, the number of times they have gotten infected. If we have, you know, an aggregate model, let's, let's put up here on the board, you know, an aggregate um, model, SEIR, maybe this is, this is the flu, maybe, maybe it's a, uh, it's a uh, STI, like gonorrhea or chlamydia, which has potentially a short, um, uh, a short uh, recovery period and then waning immunity. You might have people circulating through here. And what an aggregate model will give you over time of this system is the number of people who are susceptible, infected, exposed, uh, susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered over time, right? So you'll get out a graph of the number who are infected over time. And that's great. Um, uh, but if you want to track individuals, you want to know, for example, um, one thing you can't do with this aggregate model is ask, are the people who are infected here at this time the same people as over here? In general, with an aggregate model, you're not going to be able to, to get an answer to that question. If there's some implication in here of random, uh, random mixing, and there's some implications of uh, independence of where you go now compared to where you've been in the past, but in general, you're not going to be able to ask questions, you know, for example, give me a breakdown of the people in the population by the number of times they've been infected. Instead, this is a depiction over time at a cross-sectional level of the number of people in each of these categories. You're not tracing individual trajectories. And in certain contexts, that's okay. But if you have data, maybe administrative data, maybe data from um, from a clinical trial, maybe uh, follow-up data 
from a large scale uh, study that you're conducting longitudinally. If you have data that you want to compare with findings from the model, if you want to, if you want to cross check, interrogate the model, and 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 um, investigate its accuracy by comparing it with longitudinal data on individuals, you're not going to be able to do that with an with an aggregate model. It just doesn't give you the resolution you need to follow individuals. It's giving a series of cross-sectional depictions over time. By contrast, an individual-based model is very readily do doable. You have these synthetic histories of people that you can build up. And one of the models I've given you, which I mentioned the first day, was uh, a model on smoking history where we keep track of people's event, life events, and their history. At a more prosaic level, we could very readily add a counter for the number of times they've gotten infected cumulatively over time in any of those models we built up uh, of, of where there's uh, recurrence of infection and a loss of a uh, waning of immunity. Um, uh, individual based models, when you comes to the issue of heterogeneity, these models have a distinct advantage over aggregate models. Aggregate models are not without the ability to capture some heterogeneity. We can stratify a model by age categories. We can stratify it by sex, for example. We could stratify it by income deciles or stratify it according to uh, uh, a person's uh, educational level. But as we add in heterogeneity to an aggregate model in this way, there's a couple limitations. First of all, without going to partial differential equation models, which are an entirely different level up in terms of the technical uh, sophistication required. We cannot capture continuous aspects of heterogeneity here, um, at least outside of a few very, very special cases uh, with co flows and so on. Um, so, aggregate models are going to be limited um, in terms of how they capture heterogeneity. For example, we do a lot of work with gestational diabetes and its impact on life trajectories. Um, particularly for risk of chronic disease such as uh, type 2 diabetes. And um, uh, we are quite interested in the impact of birth weight on these later outcomes. We could stratify an aggregate model by birth weight categories, but they tend to be very coarse grained. And so we'll maybe stratify it by low birth weight, high birth weight, but it's very rough things. Whereas in an individual based model, well, you tell me, if we wanted to capture birth rate or birth weight, or we want to capture, um, well, say birth weight, for uh, an individual who is captured in our agent-based model. How would we do it? What would we do? We wanted people to be born uh, or at the starting time of the model to be told what their birth weight was. What would we do? What would we add to that person? Yeah, add a parameter. It would be a double precision value, right? It would represent weight in pounds or kilograms or what have you. Um, so all we do is we add a characteristic. And it turns out it's a very lightweight operation to add in an aspect of heterogeneity to an individual base model. And you can do so with a continuous aspect of heterogeneity. By contrast, in an aggregate model, if you have stratified a model like this one here, basically what we're doing is, if we want to stratify this by age categories, we create sort of layers to these stocks for different age categories, right? So each of these stocks, which looks like a, a single stock, a single state variable, is actually subscripted. And if we want to divide it into two different sexes, each of those needs to divide it into two different categories themselves. And as the number of, of uh, types of heterogeneity go up, two things have to happen. Number one, the number of subcategories for each of these stocks start to explode. We have a, what's called a curse of dimensionality. So if we want to divide up the 10 age categories and two sexes, suddenly we've got 10 times, 20, uh, times 2 or 20 different divisions for susceptible that we've got to keep track of. If we want to add in 10 income deciles, now we have 20 times 10 or 200 different categories. And you start getting small numbers in these individual boxes, and you've got to keep track of them. But another feature of it is that this adding in heterogeneity requires a change across the entire model. So if we want to experiment, hmm, you know, I wonder if we want to think about taking into account uh, birth weight. 
To add that to a model like that, you've got to make this global operation. Each of these flows, each of these stocks has to be subscripted accordingly. It's a quite major operation, and the formulas become a lot more entangled. You are dealing with all possible combinations of those characteristics. By contrast, you are not. You are not encumbered by those problems over here with individual base models. Adding heterogeneity N can be flexibly added, flexibly taken out. It's quite scalable in terms of separating concerns into different state charts and, and more modular in terms of its impact. Not perfectly so, but much more so than an aggregate model. I work with highly stratified aggregate models. If any are interested, I'm glad to share them. Um, some of our aggregate models might have you know, six dimensions of heterogeneity, and it's very messy once you get to that level and much cleaner at an individual base level. If you're interested in seeing a side-by-side -side comparison, I'd suggest taking a look at a model of HPV that I've provided for you, the individual base model, and I could give you the aggregate model corresponding to that. And you'll see it's like night and day. It's just much cleaner with an individual based representation in terms of its characterization of, of, uh, of the population. Um, so uh, individual based models are better for examining finer grain consequences. There's better for, for examining the outcomes, you know, in terms of network spread or transfer effects within a population. Um, how does someone's uh, history impact their, the, the success of the outcomes for them or their, their um, characteristics in terms of types of heterogeneity? And often at an individual level, we also have a better ability to articulate certain mechanistic descriptions of a system. Um, Individual-based models, despite the name, they can support multi-scale, multi-level modeling. We saw that. Um, two days ago, right, with that model of, um, uh, of hierarchical modeling, remember that, where we had cities and we had people within cities. Um, very straightforward to, uh, to accomplish. And once you've got things at an individual level, you can aggregate up, summarize up to a, to a higher level very readily, whereas the same is not true with an aggregate model. If we ever broke it down into five-year age categories, we're not going to be able to easily summarize it into, well, for the first five years of life, into one month categories and, and uh, you know, break it down beyond that into, um, you know, uh, two-year age categories. We're kind of stuck in sort of how we aggregate things to be more aggregate than the levels of stratification. And, and that's sometimes an encumbrance. You know, at a broad level, People ask me when to use one or the other. It depends a lot what you're trying to get out of it. If you're trying to get formal analytic findings, you know, of stability, you're trying to generalize your system, you're trying to reason about the possible behaviors of this model over different values of parameters, an aggregate model is going to be often a closer match to your needs if you're willing to put in the simplifications. On the other hand, individual-based models for certain types of policy recommendations for figuring out how to intervene compared to where to intervene, um, an individual-based model will often be, be uh, key to your success. Aggregate models at a general level, um, my colleague Jeff McDonnell says, um, he has a nice division, he says individual-based, well, aggregate models often can clue you in and a high-level model on where this, it, the system is most sensitive to intervention, so where to intervene within a system. But if you want to simulate the actual intervention, so particularly their implementation, the implementation science side of things, actual rollout, scale-up, sustainability, et cetera, often an individual-based model will take you much further. Um, so where to intervene, you start there sometimes, and then how to intervene, Details of policy prescriptions sometimes are hard to articulate in aggregate models and are much more readily done with an individual-based model. Um, certain types of complex policy um, recommendations, policies that take advantage of shaping social networks, shaping the network structure um, of a community or what have you, also you know, uh, benefit directly from individual-based models. So this is one of the key distinctions I like to make. Aggregate versus individual ways. You notice I'm not saying system dynamics on the left. System dynamics is a common way of delivering aggregate models, but 
you can you can have system dynamics at an individual level. It's not. It's not about that mode of description. It's nothing about stocks and flows that make them inherently aggregate. We can use them exquisitely to capture regulatory feedbacks involving continuous quantities at an individual level. Rather, this is about aggregate and individual. And I spend most of my time at this level these days, but I still do quite a bit with aggregate. And often on a given project, I will start with an aggregate and move to an individual as my understanding develops. Or I will start with an aggregate model and I will take pieces of it and turn them into individual based models. Just like we saw yesterday. Remember people flowing from an aggregate into an individual based? I can do that quite readily using, um, using a tool like AnyLogic. Have, have one that's an overall stock and flow model, take out a portion of it, put in an individual based model for that portion and work with that in an individual level. Um, very valuable because if you think about it, coming back to my points from a few days ago, often where we go with our modeling is very heavily contingent on what we learn in the modeling process, during that modeling process. And in the course of that modeling process, you may learn certain things to take you in a very different direction as to what needs to be an individual lef level formulation. And rather than needing to ahead of time say, I'm only going to do agent-based modeling, or I'm only going to do aggregate modeling, with a tool like AnyLogic, you do have that ability to take parts of it and make them individual-based and keep other parts aggregate, maybe even aggregate up sometimes. My colleague Jeff McDonald has done some wonderful work where he started with this, he goes to an individual-based model, he then comes up with an aggregate model that summarizes the learning from the agent-based models in a very compact form using different way of characterizing the situation than he thought about originally. He learned from this model and came up with a very crisp distinction um, at an aggregate level that was very different from how he started out. So he, he has sort of round trip learning and then he might present that aggregate level model to a policymaker in terms of findings from the project. So that's very valuable. So this aggregate individual based um, distinction, be very cautious about anything that says you have to start at one and stick there. There's often a real gain from having multiple models. I'll tell you another vignette here. Um, in our TV work, we had an aggregate model quite detailed, quite stratified. And then we built an individual based model and we ended up finding a bug in the individual based model um, early on. Um, this bug was actually tricky for the student involved to find. She actually spent quite some time trying to track it down. The only reason she knew about that bug was because the individual based model was not lining up with the aggregate model results for certain simplifying assumptions random mixing, for example, um, uh, that, that you might impose. So she imposed, by my suggestion, certain assumptions in the individual based model that should have made it comparable to the, agent, the aggregate model, and she found very different results. And you know, after some casting around, could it be something about the stochastics involved or the individual based characterization, we ended up finding a bug. And it was a big bug. It was an important bug. And it sits with me today, we probably wouldn't have found that bug except we had an aggregate model to compare it to. We had a point of reference. We had some way of sort of saying, is this jiving with, with what it should be when we make aggregate assumptions? Very, very valuable. Um, by contrast, there's another situation with drug-resistant gonorrhea, antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea, where we had an aggregate model, we built an individual-based model, and I think I mentioned the story on the first day um, uh, at, in another context. We, we had all sorts of good stuff in here. Mm -mm. You know, we had network structure, and, or, or we were going in that direction at least. We had some, some things, certainly. Um, network structure, individual history, ability to simulate more than two types of drugs, but multiple types of drugs. Uh, allele level representation of, of things was something we were talking about and we had done in another such model. Um, but we ended up finding big gaps between the two, big gaps between the two, early on. 
before we had actually incorporated some of these, many of these features. And we kept on simplifying and simplifying and simplifying. And we eventually found that the differences, the profound differences were caused because of the quantized nature of this population. You either, you either had zero persons with antibiotic resistant or one or more. Whereas this model, the aggregate model was assuming you could have, you know, 0.0005 people with, with drug resistant gonorrhea and it would spread like wildfire, you know, after that. And when we corrected, when we actually created in our aggregate model a quantized representation, the policy implications changed radically. Radically. And there was a published paper, was getting a lot of press, which was giving some very strong policy recommendations, which we we then took this to and, and challenged it because we found that that same model, when put with a quantized population, counterindicated those, those policy prescriptions. So just be aware, this interplay between the two, the ability to have some representation that's aggregate and compare it here, can find bugs and can find assumptions that seem innocent at the aggregate level but really affect, adversely affect the realism of the results. So those are two vignettes. Um, totally different areas, TB, drug resistant gonorrhea. Um, okay, um, let's see, other, uh, other components. Well, you know, motivations for individual based modeling. These kind of fall out of the previous thing, um, but I, I like giving them to people. You know, um, do you need to calibrate against information on ancient history? Are, are you going to be judging this model against trajectories of individuals where you have information? Do you want to capture progression of in, in, agents along multiple care pathways, like comorbidities for people? Do you want to capture learning or memories? Do you have strong history dependence, the effects of early life insults affecting their trajectories? Uh, do you need to capture localized perception among these agents? You know, I behave differently in my college applications because my social network doesn't include other people who have gone to colleges and very much, whereas yours does. Um, that might affect my college-going behavior compared to yours because of my localized knowledge and, and social capital. Um, do you want to capture decision-making? Kurt's working on some techniques, bringing together some techniques from, from um, uh, marketing side, um, discrete uh, so discrete choice theory, um, uh, with with agent based models. So you can have I agents that make decisions based on their preferences and their choice set, um, uh, in a way that's more cognitively realistic than just flipping a coin in, in terms of um, of you know a certain probability of each outcome, and that takes into account their preferences. And we've contributed similar models that. Um, um, that, are that suggest power there and Kurtz take it to another level. Um, uh, if it's easier to describe behavior at an individual level, sometimes we'll, we'll prefer these. We just know the system much better at an individual level. If you want to explain behavior across networks, if you want to seek um, distinct interventions that are based on any of these characteristics, capture impacts of interventions across many heterogeneity categories. We seek flexibility in modeling. Um, heterogeneity. We want to describe behavior for multiple scales, and we want we care about stochastics caused by individual variability. Um, I will. I saved one for the last, and that is this one here: stakeholders. So, and this is just an observation. So I deal a lot with stakeholders. Who, uh, you know, we work in cross disciplinary teams typically, and. Um, many of the people I encounter have no background in modeling and no luxury of learning modeling. But we need <coughs> those people to have a degree of confidence in our modeling. And rightly or wrongly, I have found that for different stakeholders, they, they will respond to um, certain types of modeling much more than other types. And it varies by stakeholder. Demographers will often understand a stock and flow model, a model that's aggregate, much more readily than an individual based model. Um, by contrast, clinicians who deal with patients on a per person basis can often 
much more easily relate to a discrete event model or an agent-based model than they can to an aggregate model, of, you know, which, is, which takes a certain amount of abstraction. Okay, so there's people who have come here one time before and people who have never come and you know, people in these broad categories. They're used to thinking in terms of faces and people coming to them. Um, I have shown two diverse stakeholders GIS models before and that's when things just awaken in them. They say like, that is something, okay, now I understand it, now I get it. And there's no obvious reason I would have thought this ahead of time. It's just that somehow it becomes more real to them to see this agent embedded in a certain space that they're familiar with, to see this agent in Saskatoon. Um, you know, actually circulating on streets that they know, somehow it makes it more concrete that they're dealing with people in an environment. And now they start to buy into the idea that, oh yeah, I could see a model like this, it's simulating someone's life, and the person's actually a person in an environment. Somehow it breaks through this barrier sometimes. GIS particularly, I don't know why, but GIS seems to have that magic element. And I've heard others comment that. And so if you're dealing with the human theater of modeling, if you're trying to build useful models that get used by people out there, people who have to have conviction and confidence about it, you want to take into account what is plausible for stakeholders, what they'll relate to, what they'll buy into. And sometimes that can motivate a choice of a model beyond just these you know, these nice abstract characteristics here, these characteristics listed here and in the previous slide. So just be aware that um, there, are, there are good reasons to incorporate things sometimes because a stakeholder um, needs them to, to have confidence in the modeling. Um, discrete event modeling. When would you use discrete event modeling? Or let me put it a different way. Under what conditions would you use it in portions of your model? That previous slide about when to use um, uh, individual-based model, that would be in you know, portions of your model, um, what, what, what areas of your model might you use it in. Um, discrete event modeling, well, if there's a defined workflow, right? Uh, a workflow, remember with those discrete event models, we had these sort of stages of processing of individual the individuals flow through and are processed and they're sorted into categories and they, they kind of get processed according to well-defined stages of processing. So if there's a defined workflow, um, it involves several stages of processing. Um, if what is being operated upon um, are discrete things um, as compared to continuous flows, like if you have water or chemicals or whatever, you don't want to use discrete event modeling to simulate flow of water from you know, one fish pond to another or something like that. That would not be a sensible thing. It's discrete sort of things. Um, if resources are required in this workflow to process things, so people wait or animals wait for care because resources are, are, um, are not available and queues and waiting times are a big concern, um, then, you know, discrete event modeling starts to offer some real advantages. Um, you know, if the primary way the things being operated upon interact is through queues and resources, then discrete event modeling is a great, you know, very, very uh, exquisitely expressive sort of tool for describing these processes. And if there's a need for regular movement on defined paths through irregular facilities, for example, moving, moving from one place to another within a facility to obtain resources, or to go back to a home location or to process the next, the next person flowing through, the next patient or what have you. Discrete event modeling is very favorable. Mind you, this is not either or these days. You can have discrete event modeling with agent-based modeling for some of these things, right? Um, um, aggregate modeling, when to use that? Well, if you want to characterize system evolution Evolution of elements that are highly continuous. You know, water. If you're dealing with, if you're dealing with cholera in water reservoirs, you're not going to be using agent-based modeling to characterize the reservoir. You're going to use a stock, a stock of water, at least for for portions of it. Um, or if they're interchangeable, doses of vaccine. You might you might use a stock to represent these things. 
Um, if you're dealing with different subgroups that you know differ, but only in degree, um, agent-based or aggregate modeling, system dynamics in particular, has a big focus on changing mental models of stakeholders. I mean, you know, I'm presenting these to you as sort of technical trade-offs, but the truth is, each of these techniques comes from with different values as to what it's trying to achieve. Discrete event modeling, efficiency, and lowered waiting times, greater throughput, those sort of things. Um, system dynamics focuses traditionally very heavily on changing the way people think about a system. They argue, you know, the best way to change the system for the effective is to change how the stakeholders involved think about it. And to do that, they hew to quite simple models. But more than that, they have traditionally evolved techniques such as group model building and stakeholder involvement in running models, which are designed to change the way stakeholders think about the situation. And there's some wonderful participatory modeling projects. That looks really neat. Um, uh, participatory modeling projects, uh, um, elicitation techniques that, that are designed to, to draw understanding from stakeholders and to sort of shape the mental models of stakeholders so that they better understand the complexity of the system. And System Dynamics has whole books uh, about group model building and communities and teams, which are designed to sort of help guide processes that will, um, that will help um, change the system by changing how people think about it and using models that are very deliberately simple to do that. If you need a model that executes quickly so you can have quick turnaround, an example would be, would be the Sea roads model out of MIT, John Sturman's group. Um, with climate change, which they've used with a large number of climate change um, uh, related stakeholders who run this model interactively to see the effects of you know this investment or that investment changing this, lowering emissions by this. It's a very quick execute model that's a simplified version of very complex um, climate models designed to allow for interactive uh, execution by teams of stakeholders and it's part of a learning environment. Um, um, you know, if, if, you're, um, if you want to understand, in terms of analysis, system behavior across different models for, for parameters, and you want to mathematically analyze the, the model for location or stability of equilibria, how those depend on model assumptions, parameters, uh, there, there ain't nothing like an aggregate model for doing that. Um, if you want to determine the shape of all possible modes of behavior of this model, you're not going to do that with an agent-based model. You're going to run it with different values of parameters, but whereas with an aggregate model, you might be able to, to summarize that behavior uh, for ranges of parameters very crisply and ruling out certain types of behavior and classifying the types of behavior that are possible. Um, in system dynamics, there's some amazing tools to analyze your model to identify like what's driving the system right, right now. So you'll have stocks and flows, and they'll identify the particular links that are the most high leverage links right now in the model, or the, the loops, the feedback loops that are dominant at this point. You can't do that right now in an agent-based model. But if you want to give a stakeholder an overall understanding about why they're seeing the behavior they are from the system, and you use a system dynamics model where these things are highlighted, they can come to a better understanding. Um, uh, if stakeholders want to work at a higher level, if that's what they understand and parse and are comfortable with, if you have a lack of access to buddies on the technical side, software engineering, um, uh, people who can help you build up a more articulated agent-based model, um, then, you know, it's an easier path on for, um, for system dynamics modeling for, and, and for an aggregate model, in fact. Um, um, so, uh, you know, network structure is not, it's not something that's really central to your work. And, and if you don't have much individual level understanding uh, of the behavior or data at that level, um, you know, you should think at least seriously about an aggregate model. So these are some trade-offs between these. These are speaking from a practical a practical standpoint for someone who's been doing this for well i've been you know doing multiple of these techniques for um, over two decades now these are a lot of the things i think about when when choosing between these techniques and it cuts everything from skill sets 
available to what we're trying to achieve with stakeholders, to the types of questions we're trying to answer, um, to issues having to do with the, um, the technical uh, trade-offs and the performance issues. A whole bunch of techniques, but this is knowledge from the trenches. I'm not trying to push a particular technique here. This is, when we, when we work with projects, these are the things we sweat, and I found them useful for shaping my sense of, of, of how to proceed with the project. Are these, um, are these things people would like to ask about at all? Any questions? No? Okay, um, so uh, I think we're, uh, I think, think we've covered some of the essentials there. Uh, to, um, to go from that to, um, you know, very specific cases. Um, yeah. Oh, question? Oh, yeah. Question. If, Sorry. We're, if we're at a transition point, yeah. we might as well just move now because the class starts at here at 1145. Great. Why don't we do that? Yeah. We're going to we're gonna go now in a, in a different direction. So. Yeah. Yeah. It sounded like it's like, okay, better to transition now because it's just walking over to room 115 in the yeah. same building. Uh, in, in, in the oh, same, in over there. Right. So is that the, the hayloft? It's like on the first floor, <laughs> immediately on your right. Okay. So in yesterday's first building. Floor. Yeah. Pomeroy, 115. Can you walk in the door from the, this side? Um, room right on your right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be more specific. Coming in from the south. Yes. Yeah. I guess coming in this way is not necessarily descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So coming in the door with the cafe to the left or coming in the other door? Coming in the other door, the back. Yeah. It's the, okay. the door from the south, the south yeah. is that way. Okay. Okay, great. Right. 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 American and Right. 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 It's and like and this just seems like really yeah. universal, like across like Africans to like South Americans to I don't huh. know like Europeans, like Europeans, like, Europeans, like yeah. not to them. Like, no. It's because the South Door. I think it's a grid system thing. Like a lot of cities yeah. in North America are kind of they're they're mm -hmm. they're set to point towards geographical north. Exactly. Okay, so it makes more. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense actually. Yeah, well, it's been a better system. Well, it's like it's better sound. There's nothing wrong with that system. It's just that it's a byproduct of the grid like structure. What would you say if you were trying to direct us to something? Yeah. Uh, because if I was driving people to my house, I'd say go north on Snelling. Yeah. It depends what it's, I can't say go left because I'm just coming from the other side. You never say that at home because going north on a street, like, the street would probably end somewhere and then. Right? There's no big grid system. Like it doesn't go north always. No. Well, yeah. Tasmania is not a big place. <laughs> <laughs> it's as big as Maine. It's kind of like New York City on the side. Uh, what's up? Okay. So you so can just say, like, turn right. So, uh, this, uh, so uh, this has happened twice this morning. Would I yeah. say, like, to direct people to my house? So, would I say, yeah. like, fine. you're coming Clicking from right? uh -huh. No, the key is the key. Like, what if you um, other. Are you going to do it? It's a different uh, on, the, on the local machine. Yeah, it's a different process. Okay. So it's an entirely uh, but, um, different example. These, in, uh, these keys are being blocked. You don't block. get directions. Well, they're probably being uh, intercepted by the previous console. Or based on. No. Uh, yeah, on this console. You, you, you do give it on references. Um, because the address system okay, is, this useless. is this it is useless. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 um, it's, it's an historically based address. You want to get out of it? It's not okay. geographically based. So it'll be well, this is the eighth block built in the Shinazuki. I'm, I'm wondering if it's stuck. This is the eighth block. This is the fifth house built on the block. You can't. Is this in Windows? Is this Windows? This is Windows. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We, you because should have you to right click to get out. It's not working. Build it again. The address changes. Does it control all the work? Yeah. So does yes, like, it the does, but I, not working? Yeah, okay, okay. Is what? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, like, yes, I mean. It does, it basically yes, it loses sense. some of the address pressure. Yeah, okay, yeah. now, the uh, there we go. Provide the update. Okay, uh, okay. so that's the trick, is to, is to sort of break out of it for a time. Yeah, control all the.